My name is Courtney Brennan, and I'm the Collections Manager for the Ornithology Department here at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And I've been working here for about three years, and I started volunteering here in 2010. I got my Bachelor's in Environmental Science from the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, which was quickly followed by a Master's in Environmental Science at Cleveland State University, where I studied the cadence and geographic variation of the songs of the Viri under the, my advisor, Dr. Andy Jones. Um, I'm very passionate about nature and the environment, and I'm a Cle Cleveland native. I grew up in this area and spend lots of times in all the parks in this area. And I got very interested in birding while in my undergraduate career, where I decided I really wanted to make birds the focal of my, uh, my research, and uh, I wanted to figure out a way to make a career out of it. And uh, with the help of Dr. Jones and my graduate career, it became a possibility here at the, at the Natural History Museum. So what we're going to focus on today is one aspect of my job here, which is specimen preparation. Here at the museum, we have over 35,000 birds in our avian specimen collection. And I have a group of volunteers that meet every Thursday evening, and we just add on to that massive pile of bird data. So one of the first questions I get when folks see us prepping birds is, why did you kill this bird? Where did this bird come from? And all sorts of negatively charged stuff. So most of our birds come from folks in this region that know that we will take dead birds that they find, that they either hit with their car or they found on the side of the road or flew into their house by hitting a window and they bring it to us and we can make it into a research specimen. But a lot of our birds come from local wildlife rehab centers like Lake Erie Nature and Science Center in Bay Village and Back to the Wild in Castelia where they give us, our, give us their birds that don't make it through to rehab and release. So right now we currently have several freezers that are filled with dead birds and my crew and I do our best to process all of these birds and turn these little birds into research specimens that are highly valuable to the research community and to the public as well. So one of the important things that I find with our outreach programs is informing people on what they can do to reduce bird kills in their home, at their house and in their neighborhood. So most of our birds end up in our freezers because they either flew into windows or they got killed by domestic cats and feral cats. So there are several steps people can take to reduce window kills at their houses. Um, the decals on the windows have shown to not be very effective, but what is quite effective is putting strips of paint on the outsides or strips of tape on the outsides of windows, or hanging string or feathers on the outsides of windows, and decorative things such as stained glass windows and window dividers, anything to really break up the reflection, because that's the issue at hand. The birds see the reflection of the natural environment that the window is reflecting, and they fly straight into it, which causes causes injury and 50% of the time causes death of the bird. And in the United States alone, up to 1 billion birds die in this way, about 10% of the bird population it's estimated. Another huge, another huge reason we get birds in our freezers is from cat kills. So the old saying of putting a bell on your cat, that doesn't work. Birds do not know what a bell on a cat is trying to signal to them. The, the best practice is just keep your house cat inside if possible. Um, and then that would reduce cat kills and up to 50 million birds are killed in the United States alone just by cats. They're not a natural predator, they shouldn't be in the environment, and so their presence is just detrimental to birds and other mammals and small creatures as well. So even though the focus of this is showing how our museum specimens are made, the very important part is what happens to the specimens after they're completed. So as I said before, we have 35,000 specimens in our bird collection here at the museum, and we're just adding on to that. And biological collections make innumerable contributions to science and society as a whole, ranging from many different areas of research, from public health and safety, to environmental change and tracking how the environment is changing through our biological collections, and of course the traditional taxonomy and systematics that goes on. 
um, and they are biological libraries that are irreplaceable. They're the most valuable thing, in my opinion, that the museum has to offer. So as I stated earlier, a lot of our birds come from folks in the Northeast Ohio area that just find the birds in their yard or, or on the street or whatnot. So if you should find a dead bird and you want to bring it here to the Natural History Museum, there are two very important pieces of information that we need in order to turn it into a research specimen. We need to know the location you found the bird, the more specific the better, and we need to, need to know the date you found the bird. With those pieces of information, that bird becomes a voucher specimen in time and space that we can use in our research collection. Okay, so the very beginning of our specimen preparation begins here at the freezers, where birds that we get from the public and from the rehab centers, they get held in the freezer until we are ready to process them. So these birds are roughly organized by taxonomy and priority. So when I find out how many volunteers we're gonna have for the evening, I pull out the necessary amount of birds and get them thawed out for our volunteers. So once the birds are thawed, our volunteers will turn them into a research specimen. So here is my, my prep area. You can see we use very simple tools. This is a, a very straightforward process. We're doing it the same way now that they were doing it hundreds of years ago. And uh, this is where all the action happens. So we use ground up corn cob dust to keep our hands clean, keep the feathers clean and dry to absorb moisture during the prep process. And once the birds are prepared and we're happy with how they look, we pin them to foam boards and we pin them in the position we want them to stay in. Now bird skin is so thin that it just air dries. We don't need to use any hard chemicals to dry them out. So we just pin them in the position we want them to stay and just leave them be in this awesome drying rack built by one of our uh, museum carpenters. And they'll just hang out in the drying rack for about a week if it's a small bird, a few weeks if it's a larger bird, until the skin is fully dried. Now once the skin is fully dried, all of the information that our volunteers jotted down while preparing the bird is transcribed onto these data tags. And these data tags stay with the specimen forever, and this information gets cataloged and digitized and is associated with this bird for the rest of its time here at the museum. So once the birds are dried and their tags have been attached to them, we have another volunteer that catalogs all the birds in the old school book. So once the birds are in the book, that's when they get their accession number and they officially become a research specimen. They go into the negative 60 freezer over on the other side of the room for one week. And that's to get all of the possible pests that might have hitched a ride onto the birds while they were drying or being prepared here in the prep lab. Uh, we've got open doors and windows and bugs find their way in here so the freezer makes sure that only the specimens are going into our research collection and no hitchhikers. So once they've uh, spent their week in the freezer, they go down to the, the collection where they're permanently housed and back of house where they are digitized, so all of the information that was put into the catalog and was written on the tags goes into the, the database on the computer, which eventually will be put onto VertNet, where uh, our collection can be searchable worldwide for researchers and, and people just interested in birds and the birds that we have here at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And then once they are digitized, put into our, uh, our uh, computer collection, they get integrated into the collection itself where they're permanently housed. And that whole collection is organized taxonomically and then they're organized by male, female, and by calendar date. So each bird has their own little spot in the collection. So one of the most important things that we take from each bird that we prepare is a tissue sample. And our tissue samples are permanently housed here in our negative 60 freezer where they stay until a researcher contacts me requesting tissue loans. 
And now more and more with the, uh, the growing field of doing DNA research and the affordability of the equipment required to do DNA research, uh, tissue requests are becoming more and more common. So it's even more important that we take a good, fresh tissue sample with each bird that we, we prepare here at the museum. So one of the first steps that our birds take in becoming a research specimen is they get cataloged in our big, large, old school catalog books. And we have a, a lovely volunteer, Sue DeVito, that will catalog all of our research specimens for us in their first step in uh, getting to the collection. But uh, in this book, there's some other interesting things. Uh, we recently acquired a collection of birds from the Kingman Museum, which is a small institution in Michigan. And they had uh, almost a thousand birds that just weren't really being curated, and they offered that collection of birds to us if we wanted it, and we said absolutely yes. So we have here a nice series of Kingman collection birds that are all from the same city in Michigan, which is quite interesting. But even more interesting, all of these birds are from the late 1880s, which is just incredible. So now those birds have become a part of our collection, and we honor that they're from the Kingman Museum on their specimen tags, but they are now permanently held in our research collection uh, alongside some of the birds that we're preparing today. So on Mondays, I send out an email to our volunteers asking who is available this upcoming Thursday for our skinning night, as I lovingly call our group of specimen preparators. So once I get a head count, everyone's got their little toolboxes organized over here. So once I know who's going to be joining us, I come on out and I just get their little bird prepping stations ready. So each volunteer has the same basic toolkit, some thread, some rounded scissors, small scissors, large tweezers, small tweezers, and a scalpel, and a little flashlight. Very simple. And each volunteer also gets their own little corn cob dust pile, and that's to keep the bird feathers clean, keep our hands clean, and to absorb moisture throughout the prep process. So you'll see we don't wear gloves when we prepare birds, and that's mostly because we can't see what we're doing, we really just have to feel it. So uh, it's safe, and uh, we, we go through all the precautions of, you know, we don't prep birds if you have a cut on your hand, but it's generally very safe to do this. Uh, but you'll see it's a delicate job, and you really don't see what you're doing. you got to feel what you're doing. So the corn cob dust keeps our hands clean, keeps the bird nice and clean, and uh, helps us avoid having to wash, wash the feathers because they're, they're not very fun to wash. <laughs> so here is a drying spread wing of a white fronted goose and um, this is bird is especially interesting because it came from California um, so this is what the bird wing will look like when we're drying it so we just spread the wing in a natural way and we put pins behind uh, the primaries to hold out the wing and we just want it to be in a natural position and a lot of uh, researchers are using spread wings to do morphometric information, morphometric research uh, by measuring uh, the lengths of all of the feathers and seeing how those feather lengths vary from male to female or from one region of the bird to another region of the bird. And um, so that's one of the reasons why we keep one of the wings spread. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, why do you cut the wing off? Well, traditionally, people would spread a wing, keep it attached to the bird, but then that specimen takes up twice as much room in the collection. So we opted to just remove the one, ring, one wing, they get stored in a separate place from the skin, uh, but then in that case we have to write two sets of tags, one tag goes with the wing, one tag goes with the skin. But uh, we just want to make each one of our specimens as valuable to as many different kinds of research as possible, so we do what we can to uh, get these birds out there in the world. <laughs> So our museum collection can serve many different purposes. We've had glass blowing artists and woodworkers come in. They just want to look at the birds and get a 
close-up look at the details of the feathers and the spread wings. And we also do collaborations with local undergraduate and graduate students that are looking for research projects. Uh, we had a young lady come in and measure all of the, the leg bones of white-breasted nuthatches in our collection. Uh, and we also do collaborative work with bigger institutions like USDA where we're going to work on a project trying to figure out why some birds are better at avoiding plane collisions than others. So the museum collection has a very wide reach. A lot of people ask us what we have and we try to make our collection as available as possible to people who want to utilize this data that we've collected. So here is our little collection of dowels and small wooden sticks and where they come into play in the specimen prep process is they get inserted into the bird prior to being stuffed with cotton and what this does is it acts as a, a stabilizing agent. So you can see I've cut the stick back as far as I could once the bird is dry but these are very fragile little specimens. It's just they're dried skin and cotton inside, so they're very, very delicate. And the stick acts as a stabilizer uh, to keep the head on nice and snug and to keep it, keep it from falling apart. Because some of our, our older specimens, we're talking like really old, like 1800s old, that they don't have a stick, a lot of their the neck skin's starting to rip and their heads are falling off. So we want our specimens to last as long as possible, so we add the stick just as a stabilizer to uh, keep that little specimen strong. So we want to make each of our specimens as valuable as possible, and we do that by taking as much data as we can for each bird that we prepare. And all of that information gets jotted down into our prep books. So you can see each section, you can get an idea of all the information that we're gathering from each bird. So the scientific name, the sex of the bird, we try to find out the age of the bird when it died, the collection date, and if somebody wrote their name down, that who salvaged the bird for us, that name goes on the tag with that bird. So if you bring in a bird and write your name down, you're the official collector of that bird. And then, of course, the, the obvious measurements, we weigh the bird, we measure its wing cord, which is the length from the elbow to the tip of the longest feather, and we measure the wingspan. And then a lot of birds, you can't tell if it's male or female by looking at it, so you have to actually open the bird up and find its gonads, and we find their gonads and measure them, and then we describe any fat content, so what condition the bird was in. So a lot of the fall migrant birds have a lot of fat on them. They're preparing for the big trip down south. And uh, we jot if they're going through any molting process or if they're growing in any new feathers. And uh, we open up their stomachs to see what they were eating during, during their time before they died. And all of that information gets jotted down in this book. And this information gets transcribed onto the small specimen tags that gets attached to the bird and it stays with that bird forever. So this is the, the hub, the first point of all of the data that we collect for our birds. So after the birds are dried and cataloged, they have to go into the negative 60 freezer for a week before they can be moved safely to our research collection. So all of our birds will just get placed gently into these giant tubs and then we cover them with cotton and then we double bag each tub. So we put one garbage bag over it and then do another one and then they hang out in the freezer and this creates an environment that no insect or insect eggs can survive ensuring that only our specimens are going to the collection and not any hitchhiker pests. Okay, so once our birds have been safely packed away in a tub for one week, in our negative 60 freezer, these specimens are now ready to be transported to our collection where they will be permanently housed.